Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to die for us, to reconcile us back to you. We that are rebels and were rebels, that reveled in the darkness, you have, through your grace and mercy, paid the price for our rebellion to bring us back into your presence which is light and goodness. And you did this not because you had to, far from it. We were deserving only of one thing and that was eternal punishment. You did it because you are love, you are mercy and you extend that out to us who are rebels merely because of that grace and mercy that is part of your nature. And for that we thank you and for that we gather together today and are capable of gathering together today to worship and praise you for the glorious sacrifice that you made and that your son made and that has been put into effect by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray today that we grow in more and more in your likeness as Benji read from 1 Peter that we as believers are being built into a spiritual house to offer good and worthy sacrifices, to become more like Christ. And one of the major means that you have ordained for that to be to become so, that we become more like Christ, is the preaching of your word, the study of it and the application of that to our lives. And because of that, I ask that the words that come from my mouth are clear and that our hearts are receptive to apply that which you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just ask for a glass of water, if someone can get that? Otherwise I'm going to have problems speaking. (laughs) Christmas 2007. Myself, Amanda and her brother leave Melbourne to drive to her grandparents' place in country Victoria in a town called Beechworth. This theoretically should have been a three and a half hour trip. Pretty standard drive. We were taking some backcountry roads which we knew was the quicker route to get there. Pretty standard trip. Amanda and um, her brother had made this trip many times. I hadn't. I'm the one driving. Both Amanda and her brother are both reading. About two hours into the trip, I'm asked the question, where are we, Steve? I respond, don't know. I thought you were going to tell me where to turn off. The map was taken out and a new route was devised for a trip on an unsealed road. Really, how bad could it be? The route started out okay but quickly degenerated into a four-wheel drive track. We were in a barina. In bushland, in summer, with no water and having seen signs about fire danger. At some point, somebody asks, mobile phone reception? No. No, no. Right about now, we're getting rather concerned about our safety. It was a, by now, it would have been a few hour walk out of um, summer bushland in Australia. I was navigating deep ruts on a messy track that would have easily disabled the car if any of the tyres had actually entered these ruts. After driving quite a way, not at all comfortable with the circumstances of our safety, eventually we got off the track and got to Amanda's grandparents. In total it took six hours to get there when it should have taken 3.5. The problem in this situation was ignorance about who was in charge and where we were, and where we were heading. I had assumed that they were leading me and I was just going to be told where to turn off. That assumption was wrong. There was no one in charge. We extended our trip significantly, ended up messing up the back suspension of the car, but all in all, not that great, not that big a deal compared to what could have ended up happening. This was just a car trip and it turned out okay. The problem is, is that many Christians have a problem with ignorance about who exactly they are following and what this means to their day-to-day life. Today, I want to turn to Mark to look at first the question, who it is that we are following, or at least should be following, and then focus more on what following or not following actually means to our lives? What are the implications of following the one who we follow? 
The sermon today will firstly answer the question of who Jesus is and the second part will then answer the question of so what? Mark 8, 27 to 30. Jesus and his disciples went out to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. The context of this passage is, this is the last passage in the the first half of the book of Mark. From now on, the book of Mark will shift to a different focus. This passage is the climax and the conclusion to the first half. Up until this point, only God and demons have identified who Jesus is. The Father proclaimed Um, who Jesus was at his baptism. So we find in chapter 1, verse 11, he says the following. And a voice came from heaven. This is at Jesus' baptism. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Throughout the book, the demons have also proclaimed similar things about Jesus. They've recognised who he is. However, in contrast to God, who's a good witness, the demons are a bad witness, Um, In contrast to that, the scribes have proclaimed that Jesus is possessed by Beelzebub. The people of his hometown have seen everything he's been doing and they ask the question, is this not the carpenter's son? As they try to put him back into his place as merely just a carpenter's or a carpenter's son. And the people have speculated that Jesus is John the Baptist, raised from the dead, a prophet or Elijah. The disciples who have been with Jesus, who have seen all the great miracles that he's been doing, the fact that he is able to tell the sea to calm down at with just a word, the fact that he is able to raise the dead. They have asked, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? They are ignorant to who he is. They have failed to understand Jesus' parables. They have failed to understand how it is that he walks on the water and what this means. They've failed to understand the fact that he can, and the means by which he can feed 5,000 and the 4,000. They are, blind in, uh, they are blind and Jesus in frustration in 8.21, which is the passage just before the one I read this morning, he says the following in frustration. He said to them, do you still not understand? They have seen so much, but yet just don't get it. In light of the prophecies about the coming one, this great king who was going to come, that was going to um, free people from spiritual bondage, who was going to take the sins upon himself, the one who was going to, to re- release people from physical bondage to do miracles, they should have been able to understand as good Jews who had grown up with these prophecies, hearing them over and over again. They should have had some at least inkling of who it is that they saw, but they didn't. They were blind and this needed to be fixed. All in all, they are ignorant of who Jesus is, what his role is and what it means for their lives. This must be overcome as Jesus is preparing them to be the future leaders of his new community that he's gathering. This must be overcome for them to be true and faithful followers of him and leaders. 8, 27 to 28. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. As the first half of this book closes, let's see what unfolds. As Jesus hits the road, he gives them a pop quiz to see where they are at. He does this by asking them two simple questions. The first question asks them about who the people say he is. And he frames this in such a way by saying, who do men say? Um, That's the word that underlies people in the NIV here. Who do men say that I am? Throughout the book of Mark, this word men or people is used in a negative sense. It's generally used of those who just don't get it. The truth of the gospel is completely veiled to their their eyes. And he asks them, "Who who do these veiled, or these people who don't get it, what do they say about me? 
And the answer is, John the Baptist, come back to life again. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. While their answer is significant, they're recognising in Jesus something, something um, important is happening in history. They don't really get just how important <laughs> Jesus is. They ultimately are inadequate answers and they assign to Jesus only a preparatory role in God's plan of salvation. But the truth of the matter is Jesus is more than merely just preparation. He is the main game. But the people are merely just putting to him a preparatory role. 8.29 But what about you, he asked? Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. With this question, Jesus asked his disciples about their opinion. In light of the fact that the last group was framed negatively and their answer was only ever going to be partial or, in worst case scenario, completely false, Jesus is asking, when he asked for their opinion, for them to be more perceptive than men. And Peter's answer, you are the Christ. Peter acts here as the spokesman for the Twelve and in the rest of the book of Mark, Peter will now become the spokesperson and leader of these 12 people. Peter answers that Jesus is the Christ. Finally, he understands. The basic meaning of Messiah is essentially the anointed one of God. That's what Christ equals Messiah. The basic meaning of Messiah is the one anointed by God. In the Old Testament, the king is the most commonly designated one as the anointed one. In addition to that, in the Old Testament it was prophesied that a future king would rule over an everlasting kingdom. So Peter's answer is right. He understands that Jesus is this future king. Finally he sees the significance of who Jesus is. And this is significant because all up until now all the disciples have missed the point. They just have not understood it. Finally they see. However, there is a complication in, the, in, this, in this identification. In the first century, there were various views of what Messiah would be. For instance, the the situation is extremely complex. By the time the first century comes around, many people have many ideas. And as one example of the complexity of the ideas that that are around this idea of Christ and Messiah, there's a community called the Essene community, which is just one of the many Jewish religious communities. They actually believe that there would be two Messiahs, not just one a royal and a priestly Messiah. And this is one example of the sort of complexities that you find in the first century when it comes to who Messiah is going to be, who is going to be the Christ. But while there are many different strands of belief, a common hope could be found in all of these, that there would be a king who would primarily release the Israelites from foreign rule. This is sort of the common thread that seems to run through most of the strands of tradition about Messiah. Hence, in the first century, it's a politically charged title for the Israelites. And Jesus, because of this, had a reluctance to apply the title to himself. Because the second you start saying you're the Christ, the listeners hear this as we're going to be politically freed from Roman rule. And this was too narrow a, narrow a title, too narrow an idea for what Jesus was going to come, going to do. Therefore, he rejects applying this to himself, even though, from an Old Testament perspective, he is the Anointed One of God. He is the King. But their ideas of that are too narrow, too small, and too inadequate for who he is and what he has come to do. In light of this, Jesus tells them in verse 30. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He doesn't want the complication of people crowding around him looking for such a narrow hope of mere political freedom for Israel. The true concept of who the Christ is, who the Messiah is, involved much more than that. With Peter's declaration, the first half of the Gospel is concluded as the disciples finally recognise Jesus for who he is. In the first half, Jesus is shown to be the true and compassionate Son of God, the Christ the anointed one who's gathering a new community of people by calling people to repent of their sins, to be right with God and to follow him. And this call is the call that we still cry out to the world. While Peter appears to see, the question is how clearly does he see? What is his concept of Jesus' role as Messiah? Let's see, 31 to 33. He then, 8, 31 to 33, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, 
chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. With Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ, the first half of the book is concluded and a shift occurs in the book to a new direction, to a new focus, because finally Jesus has got his disciples to the point of recognising how central he is to history. However, now he has to then explain what his role, what this significant role of being Messiah actually means in contrast to the ideas that clustered around the idea of Messiah in the first century. Jesus begins preparing his disciples for the journey to Jerusalem where he will meet death and will then be resurrected. And the following section answers what it is to be Messiah and what it means to be identified with him. Verse 31 and 32. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. He then began to teach them. This is the first thing after finally Peter says you are the Christ. The first thing that Jesus has to get onto straight away is teaching (laughs) because he knows all these ideas that are clustering around this idea of Messiah and Christ that Peter has just said. As true as it is in an Old Testament sense, he knows that he has to teach them to get their head in the right place of what this means because he does not want all the baggage of the culture coming along with that. So he automatically turns to teaching. In light of Peter's declaration of him as Messiah and narrow and false concepts of that, Jesus did not leave it up to the disciples to fill in the blanks of what Jesus' role as Messiah is and will be. Far from it, he is going to explain to them what it is to be Messiah over and against popular expectation. And popular expectation did not, from any record that we have, appear to have any concept of a suffering Christ, of a suffering Messiah. Nothing, zero zilch. So he has to teach them because this is central to what he is as Christ, as the king of the universe. One of the central things that he is going to do is die and he has to explain this to them because they want political freedom. It's far too narrow. He has come to be the suffering servant to die for the sins of the world not merely just to release Israel from political slavery. Jesus teaches his disciples that this very path that he is going to take as God's servant that involves suffering, rejection and death, that this is going to happen and that God will ultimately raise him to life. And the purpose of this can be only understood within the framework of understanding Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12, which I'm not going to read out, that is a prophecy that ultimately that the suffering servant, that is who Jesus is, would die in our place, taking upon himself our sins. And after doing that, that he would be resurrected. And this is what he has to get into their heads. And this is what he has to teach them. First, 32 to 33. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Jesus, the necessity of Jesus teaching them becomes clear at this point. As soon as Jesus tells them about a suffering servant or a suffering Messiah and the fact that he needs to do these things, Peter automatically gets into his teaching role to put Jesus back in the box. Jesus isn't fitting, isn't fitting here into the popular understanding of what Messiah was to be. Didn't fit into Peter's, that's for sure. So Peter rebukes him. Jesus retorts. Jesus is a teacher. The humility of our Lord that he would be corrected (laughs) or even allow this to go down the way that it went down is amazing and astounds me. He is the king of the universe and he is willing to have somebody act like this towards him. But he doesn't let it just go. (laughs) Jesus retorts that Peter is out of line. At this, Jesus uses Peter's rebukes as a situation to teach not just Peter, but all of the disciples. 
that such thinking is not of God but of Satan. In conjunction with this, Jesus orders Peter to get back into the proper place that is behind him, following him, learning from him, not correcting him, especially when he is in the one in desperate need of correction of what Messiah is going to be. All in all, the disciples are slowly developing and they have begun to see a small part of who Christ is. However, Jesus' teaching of his followers was far from complete. They needed a clear vision of who Jesus was. An inability to accept a suffering Messiah was in fact rejection of the will of God and Jesus strongly rebukes such a thought. And Jesus reduces the alternatives to two. Either one follows Jesus or one opposes Jesus. Either one takes the role of Satan or the role of a disciple. Either one sets his or her mind on the things of God or on the things of man. So I want to now look at the question of so what? I know that for most of you I have not said anything new. <laughs> you already know that Jesus is the Christ. You already know the fact that he is going to die, that, that he was going to die and that he was risen again. However, I want to look at the question more for the rest of this message on so what? And so we're going to look at the next section of Mark because that's a major focus of Mark is teaching people what it is to follow Christ. So let's read on. Chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. On the basis of the nature of the king, these verses spell out the implications of what it means to follow him. Our king, the one we follow, the king of the universe, the one who will ultimately judge all people at the end of time, is the king who suffered and died for others. What are the implications of that for those who follow him? Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus at this point calls the crowd to hear him. This is significant. Jesus is making it clear that there is only one standard of discipleship. There isn't one standard for leaders and another, one, another for everyone else. There is one absolute standard. One standard alone that applies when it comes to following Jesus. And Jesus sets out this standard as such. If anyone desires to follow his kingship and be part of the kingdom that he is ushering in and that he is ushered in, There were three commands to undertake. First of all, you have to deny yourself. You have to, two, take up the cross, and to, three, keep on following. What does this mean to deny oneself? It basically calls a person to shift the centre of the gravity of their life from your interests to the interests of God. And what are the interests of God that currently exist? I would pretty much summarise God's interests on this world to two fast as a church, all churches. The first one is that we are to be concerned for the lost. As Jesus came to save and to make the way for salvation, we are to extend that salvation to others. That's the first person, first major purpose. The second major purpose is that we are to support and serve each other once people have become Christians to make them more Christ-like. These are the two. I would be happy for anyone to try to think of any other ones, but I think that the two primary ones that the church currently undertakes. The building up of each other to become more like Christ and then going out to the world to bring in the lost, to save them, to then build them up to become more like Christ. The level of this demand is then reinforced by the second command that we take up our crosses. The image here is that of the condemned criminal carrying his crossbar 
which would be used in his execution. In other words, Jesus is telling people that following him is not an easy path, but the one could, that could, in the worst case scenario, could lead to their death. As he was going to be hated and killed, his followers should also expect similar treatment. This was not mere exaggeration. For the disciples that were told this directly, many of them went on to die for the cause of Christ. The world hates the lights as the light proclaims God and the darkness revolts against it. This is not mere exaggeration. And this same problem exists today, that as the light proclaims the light, the darkness revolts against it. So Jesus is saying, expect to be persecuted for me. In other words, the way of Jesus is a hard way as we represent God in a world that rebels against him is a way that requires steadfast following of him. Jesus then gives four reasons for this extremely hard call. Verse 35. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. The first half of verse 35 warns a person to not ignore the call. Jesus is saying that if we try to secure our physical life now and our physical comforts now by not following Jesus now, we will ultimately lose eternal life. This is because by not following Jesus we will still be lost in our sins and eternal judgment for our sins will still will come upon us. On the other hand, if we take up God's values in the here and now, by which we may lose our life in the here and now, we lose nothing really, but rather we receive eternal life. And this is the value of the kingdom. So I want at this point you to think about this, to hear what Jesus is saying. If you turn from following Jesus because following Jesus sounds too hard, or you find it requires too much sacrifice for you, be warned that your concern about securing your physical life now will mean that you will lose it eternally. These are high stakes. Here the principal Christians have eternal values. Concern yourself for things that actually matter, which is salvation of the lost and the building up of each other to become more like Christ. Because all the other stuff, money, houses, cars, boats, mean nothing in the end. We will stand before God and he will ask us, what have you done? And it will not concern him what we have gathered for ourselves in physical things, here and now. So hear that. Verse 36 and 37. What good is it, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus gives another reason, but really is building upon the last one. He gives two questions to get you to think. Jesus uses commercial imagery here in these two questions to get you to think about the investment that you are making with your life and with the energy that you expend here on earth. Verse 36 what good, is it, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world yet forfeit his soul? If you are hesitant in following Jesus and making him the Lord and Saviour of your life, think about the investment because the return is poor and the gain is short term. You could gain the whole world. You could gain all the stuff that the world asks us to buy and to invest in, in the here and now, but it doesn't go beyond the grave. In the end, you will die, you will be in a box or burnt. And all that stuff that you've gathered, whether it's money, possessions, fame, honour, all of those things are ultimately completely and utterly useless because the day comes when we die and we have to stand before God. All the things that we have gathered will just be redistributed to other people here on earth who all many of them hoping that by gathering these things it means something. 
But you don't even end up with it in the end. You're dead in a box. You don't have it. Other people have the stuff with this vain hope that it means something. The return is poor for all that you can gain. The cost is rejection ultimately as you made everything but God the centre of your life because you will stand before God and you will be rejected because you did not have his as your value. You had empty, meaningless stuff. Verse 37. Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The second question lays out the poor currency of living for the here and now. You don't even get anything beyond the grave. Therefore, you've got nothing to give in exchange for the very thing that you actually do need and that is eternal life. And secondly, even if you did have everything, it still wouldn't be good enough. It does not... What possession has anyone ever gained that has helped them extend their life beyond the grave? None. It is of no use to any of us. Verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The character of the way of loss is now defined in concrete terms. In the end, the way that you have conducted your life here on earth will be called into account. If it is being characterised by not following Jesus in his way, Jesus will reject you. If you're concerned about what others thought if you said you were a Christian, you lose everything as Jesus brings upon you the judgement you deserve as you rejected the very salvation that he offered. In conclusion, as Jesus is the servant king, he calls you to follow and sacrifice as he did, which is to make God and his values the centre of your life. In light of this statement, I want to suggest a few ways that this plays out as Christians. This principle that the stuff doesn't matter because it ultimately doesn't get you, that doesn't get you anything in the end because you lose it all at your death. I want to suggest four ways that this plays out. Think about how you use your time. If your time is largely spent on everything but the two major values of God, which is the salvation of the lost and the supporting of other believers who have been lost and now saved, become more like Christ. If it isn't focused, if so much of your time, so little time is spent on those two primary purposes, think seriously about what you're investing in. Think seriously. And this is a hard lesson for us in the West because we have many, many ways and many ways, many times have bought into the lie that the stuff matters. It doesn't. We want to get before God as believers and be able to say and be able to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You gave up everything. You made me the centre of your life. We want to hear those words. So think about how you use your time. Where is your time being invested? Money. Think about where your money is going. (laughs) Where we put our money is a demonstration of where our heart is. If very little of it, and I'm not suggesting, standing here and suggesting that all of your time and money has to go into um, everything Christian, (laughs) But everything, God should ultimately be the ultimate value in our lives. If only a very small amount of your money is going towards God, think seriously about where you're investing. Think seriously because it's going to come to nothing in the end. Boldness. Don't be concerned about what others say. Be bold about who Christ is. Proclaim the gospel. Don't be ashamed. This might be an issue of sharing your faith. This might be an issue of you're not getting baptised because you're afraid of what other people might say. It might be ashamed of telling your family about the gospel. Whatever it is, be bold. We have called, been called by the servant king who went to death on a cross to follow him. Be bold. And if you're like, meh, meh, you know, meh, I'll just take Christ the Saviour and not Christ the Lord and not Christ the Servant. Yeah, I'll take Christ. The Sa- I'll just take the Saviour one. Think, I want you to see, if that's your attitude, seriously think 
about your position before Christ. Examine your faith. We have been called to eternal significance to follow the servant king, the glorious one who put down and gave up his life so that others could live. Think seriously about where you're investing, your time, your money, your life. Invest in eternal things, things that will last. And the whole point of this, the whole, the whole, the whole you know, um, return on your investment, ultimately, if you take the servant way, the reward is grace. You're not losing something, you're gaining something that actually matters. Think about this. I started off by saying, don't be ignorant about who you are following and where you are going. Invest in things that matter. Invest in eternity. The book of Mark. Jesus is the servant king. He calls you to follow and sacrifice as he did, which is to make God and his values the centre of your life. And this ultimately will lead to eternal reward beyond the grave. Invest in that.